Welcome to this tutorial on object orientation and classes in Python. In this tutorial I will use the Jupyter Notebook B09 minus classes.ipnb that you can find in the course repository. I will assume that you understand what are functions in Python and that you might have an idea how to style your code which is becoming a little bit more important now when you're dealing with classes. So before we dive into the definition of classes, let's have a look here at the definition of object-oriented programming. You will find very often also the abbreviation here of OOP, so that stands for object-oriented programming, which is a paradigm which aligns to the architecture of a software with reality. So maybe a blueprint for a house might be the class then for a house that will be uh, built a, a couple of times. We also need some basic terminology or common terminology here in the following and the terminology that is most important here is the difference between objects and classes. While a class is the blueprint of an object or in this example here the blueprint for creating an ice cream based on, a, uh, uh, based on attributes like a, a size, flavors or container, the object is then the instance of the class. So the instance of the class then contains attributes or properties in the form of code huh? and, uh, and features in the form of methods. These class objects then, also these instances of the class, will have a concept of self regarding the attributes and methods. So that self internally, internally refers to the properties of the class. Sounds a little bit fuzzy? Well, let's dive a little bit into an example here with this ice cream class. In line with this style guide, I'm using here camel case naming for the class. So capital I then and then cream, ice cream. Then I define attributes of the class in the term of size that could be maybe one scoop, two scoops or three scoops or small, medium, large. Then I would define basic flavors that could be available like vanilla, cherry and chocolate and a container that could be a cup or a coin. Now if I want to instantiate objects of that class, I can do that by defining maybe here a three scoop cone. So the a scre a three scoop cone would then make use of a container type uh, coronet um, or waffle, uh, flavors whatever you want, maybe three different flavors from what we have here in our default. And the size, if it's three scoops, could then be three scoops or large. Similarly, we could also uh, instantiate another object here that I would call my two scoop cup, where I would then just use a container that is a cup. Uh, size would then be two scoops or medium, and the flavor in that case here probably two times chocolate. I also want to draw here your attention to how I named the variables. They are all in lower cases, and I separated words here with underscores again in line with the Python style guides. So now you got here a visual example. Let's have a look at how that looks in a coded example. This here is now this uh, ice cream class. So the structure, that basic structure that I want to instantiate um, a little bit lower here. I start this ice cream class with an init function, which is basically a magic method. We will hear more about magic methods later in this tutorial. For now, we just take it uh, as is and as something that every class wants to have. Then in this magic method or this init function here, I add first a self argument and then option arguments and then option keyword arguments, why I'm not using them here for now. In this initialization 
uh, method here, I'm initializing all the attributes that my class should have. So I'm defining it here with a self dot flavors. So these are my three flavors uh, that could maybe uh, be chocolate, vanilla, uh, or bread or not bread. Um, and according to the style guide, I should also have here two white spaces around the equal sign. Now I can assign another meth uh, method here that would be add flavor. So maybe you want to add a flavor later on. And this method here again has this notion of self and then the flavor that I want to add. I can also add another method here that would then be um, uh, print the flavors. So just return me what flavors are currently contained in the self.flavors list. And here we'll just use here that um, join function here of uh, lists that I mentioned already in other tutorials. Important is here when I'm instantiating an object of the ice cream class, it will automatically call here that initialization method. So as soon as I create any object here, I will have the flavors list available um, in that blueprint of the ice cream class. The self argument here is something that you will not see externally. So let's look here at that example where we are uh, first instantiating an ice cream class object. I don't need to pri provide it with any arguments because the initialization function only takes optional arguments or optional keyword arguments. There's nothing here between the self and these optional parts. If I would add here something where I need to add um, another flavor or directly here already the container type, then um, I needed to add here uh, an argument for the initialization of the class. But step by step, let's keep it simple for the moment. We just initialize the class that doesn't need any argument. Now I am adding a flavor to my object of the ice cream class. So I'm using here the add flavor method and I, I can access it here with the dot. And this one here requires an argument in the form of flavor and now I'm adding lemon. So I want to check now if that is also really now in my flavors list of my object, um, which will then make use here of that print statement. Otherwise, I can also just um, access the flavors list through uh, printing um, the flavors attribute. So to access the flavors attribute, I will not need to add here uh, any parentheses because it's not a method of the class. Huh? If I want to call a method, I need to add the parentheses potentially with any input argument, but the uh, flavors method here doesn't need arguments. Only, it has only here this self notion. So let's run that code block and we see we successfully added here that lemon flavor. Just important note here that this lemon flavor is now only in our some scoops object and not added to the ice cream class basically. So this guy here still doesn't know anything about lemon. It's only here in the some scoops object that now we have the lemon flavor. Classes can also inherit from each other. And this inheritance is very similar to inheritance in biology. You can find here in the Cambridge Dictionary the definition of inheritance as particular characteristics received from parents through genes. While we don't have really genes in Python, but we have a basic structure with attributes that one class can inherit from another class. So let's take here the example of two classes where we have a fish class. So that is here the basic definition of the fish class that I will make now the parent class. Um, it doesn't inherit anything. It's the parent class. Huh? It has again this initialization magic method, always needed somehow. Huh? 
I am here in uh, instantiating now ob uh, a class attributes in the form of a preferred flow depth or water depth, however you want to call it, and a preferred flow velocity of a fish. So a fish might have a, any preference for, uh, for water depths or flow velocities, also maybe as a function of its age. Then a fish might have a certain uh, type or species, and it will be somewhere at an xy position on the world somewhere. The uh, preferred depth and velocity attributes should be float, so numeric, and the xy position should be here a tuple with x and y coordinates, while the species should be by default a string. Now, these water depth here and flow velocity uh, attributes would also lead to a definition of some uh, ha um, physical habitat preferences. To print these habitat preferences to the screen, we can use something like th that print function here. If you did already the style conventions tutorial, you will find a little mistake here in terms of the line length. So if you want, you can just uh, break the or stop the video here and try to restyle it. Anyway, let's go on here. I also added here another method to the uh, fish class, and that is swim to position, and that will require, of course, a new position. So that swim to position function will basically replace the existing xy position with a new position. Okay, so that's our basic structure for the fish class. Now let's look at a salmon class which can inherit uh, attributes of the fish class. For having that inheritance implemented here, we first need to add a parenthesis to the definition of the salmon class. So you see here we didn't have parentheses for that inheritance here. I'm defining now um, inheritance as a function here of uh, the fish class with parentheses. I'm putting in the parentheses uh, and the fish class in the parentheses. This is not yet complete for initializing the uh, fish class attributes and methods. To get that, I will also need here to write fish dot init self, so with a self understanding here now of uh, the salmon class. Um, so only after writing that I will have now all uh, attributes, so these guys here, and methods, these guys here, available in the salmon class. In the salmon class initialization, now I am actually requiring one argument and that is the species. There will be some options to uh, define that species and I will show you that here now when we are instantiating the objects of that salmon class. I also add here a new habitat function or method to the uh, salmon class where I am requiring depth and velocity uh, arguments to override the existing preferred uh, flow depth or water depth and flow velocity attributes of my class. What I also added here in the initialization is that the, uh, the family is a Salmonidae. Now I am in instantiating here first an Atlantic salmon object, which is the species Salmo Salar. So I'm providing you the species name um, as an argument to the instantiation of a salmon class object. Then I make use here of that habitat function method that is in the salmon class and I'm assigning it now a depth of 0.4 and a velocity of 0.5. Wherever you are in the world, that might be meters and meters per second, or uh, uh, feet and feet per second, whatever. And then I'm printing now the habitat preferences. 
And just recall that the print habitat method stems here basically from the fish class from which our salmon class inherits. In addition here now I'm instantiating another object of the salmon class. Now I'm instantiating a Pacific salmon. Um, it is Oncorhynchus javicha, I hope I spelled that correctly, um, which has different preferences for uh, physical habitat conditions and also maybe in a sense of its life stage where it is. So these numbers here are rather arbitrary. Um, and then I uh, print again the habitat. So let's run this uh, code block again and you see here I'm, I can make use here of the habitat function method in the summon class and at the same time uh, use the print method that is defined here in the fish class. So just recall here to get this, uh, um, these attributes accessible here in the, initial, uh, in the initialization, you need to write here the parent class dot init and self. When we have classes that inherit from each other, we can also make use of so-called polymorphism. So what does that mean? Well, in computer science, that basically means the ability to present the same programming interface for basic structures or for different basic structures. Practically, that means if we had in the fish class the definition of a swim to position function, then we could also uh, write another swim to position function in the Salmon class that would then supersede or overwrite the one from the parent class. So if the Salmon class also has a swim to position class, it will overwrite the one here in the fish class. This polymorphism might become very useful if you are importing an object from an existing library maybe from NumPy or whatever, and you want to override the behavior of a certain function. So in that case, you would just write your own class that inherits from the library object. Then you would initialize these, the library object and the initialization function and maybe add another method to that class um, or to your own class that would then over uh, write the original method from the library. Classes can also have public and non-public attributes. Everything that you've seen until now are public attributes. To define non-public attributes, you can make use of the so-called encapsulation concept. So what that basically does, it uses a, a concept of a data hiding. Uh, you can click here the link to learn more about that. In the style guide, I was already referring to a single leading underscore variables and double leading underscore variables. A single leading underscore variable as a method name in a class will not have a technical impact, it will just signify that this um, attribute should be rather private, um, but it won't be technically private. If you're using double leading underscore uh, attributes, those are also technically um, private and you cannot modify them from outside when you instantiated that object. So that would then basically define a private variable. So let's uh, have a look at an example to get a better idea of what that could be or why we want to use maybe a private variable. So you may recall the example of the ice cream class and one good attribute here of that ice cream class would be its aggregate state that should be frozen. If you want to manipulate that ice cream state, you may want to combine it with some other function and the change of that attribute should maybe be related 
to, uh, onto calling other processes or overwriting other variables. So you only want that attribute then to be accessible through another method. That would then be typically a setter method. Other example, let's go back to fish. So here I define now another um, child class of the fish method. This time I'm using carp. I'm initializing here again, similar as the summon class, um, the uh, also all attributes here of the fish class. Now I'm uh, assigning here the attribute family with two leading underscores. So this will be a private variable, a private attribute here of the class. Otherwise, the species is again the same as what we had for the summon definitions. Now, to print out what my family is here of the carp, um, I need to define an add property um, wrapper around that self method here of the class. And it simply returns that private attribute. But I need to, uh, uh, need to define that property method here to be able to print what the family attribute is. Now if I want still the option to override that family attribute, that could then be related to something else that I'm needing to do here with the um, carp class. It would basically not change, um, so uh, not, not be a good idea here to change it in general because it would be not be a carp anymore if I would change the family. But for ever, whatever reason, maybe you want to, put, to change it to a dead fish and so on, um, then you maybe want to change other things, other attributes here that you um, want to trigger with an own method. And for that purpose, for changing now that variable, you can define an add family dot setter class. Important here is just that it has the same name here of the attribute um, that follows the two leading underscores. Now that family setter method here will require a value for overriding it again. So you have already seen these add signs and decorators and wrappers of functions. If you want to recall what these wrappers were, uh, just I invite you to have a look here uh, by clicking on that link. Okay, let's get back to our cup. We instantiate here an object of the cup class. I'm providing it here with the species that is uh, basically European cup. Now I'm printing here the European cup dot family attribute, which is possible because I defined here the add property method. Then I'm trying here to print the European carp underscore underscore family, which will not work because I made it a private or technically private attribute. So you cannot see that from outside. I can still redefine the, uh, the family attribute here because I defined here that add family setter. If I do that here, it will also trigger everything else that I put here into that method. So running this script will print here that statement. If the class or uh, the self dot underscore underscore family attribute would not be private, um, then I wouldn't need that add setter function, uh, the, yeah, that add setter method here to overwrite its value. But I could also not add something like this um, print statement here that tells me I set now the family to Lamnide. Now you have seen that a class might have private attributes that you can still modify with decorators such as the attribute dot setter. There are still some other uh, decorators that you can use like a deleter, getter and the setter we have already seen. Let's have a look at another example and how you can use 
these decorators. Here I am defining another child class or the fish parent class that again requires species. Um, I'm defining again the family here as a private attribute and I'm defining now also the length as a private attribute. If that is physically meaningful or not to define an attribute as a constant value that is private to a class structure that um, we can leave apart here. Um, so still we um, can change that length attribute now here with uh, the setter method. Here I'm trying to change now the length by assigning a float value if the provided value is a float. If that is not a float then the method will return a value error. We can still access the length here with the add property function itself. And what I added now here is a deleter method that just deletes that attribute of uh, length. So everything you see here is still pretty similar to the previous example with carp. I'm instanting, instantiating here now an object of the bullhead that I'm um, uh, with a species name Cotus govio. Um, here I'm making use of the add property getter, which is basically embraced here with, the, uh, uh, with that method. Then I am using here the setter method to assign another length. And I'm using here numeric values, so that will work. Now I'm using here the new delete method. And that work, uh, works by writing here del for delete and European bullhead dot length. With that I'm just removing now that private or um, a publicly accessible attribute of the length from my object. So if I run that I can see here that if I try to access now here the length attribute of the European bullhead uh, object will not work and uh, that will run into an error because I deleted it. For a couple of times now I made reference to magic methods. For instance you have seen the init magic method uh, for the initialization of a class that defines attributes upon the instantiation of an object of that class. Magic methods can also be used for overloading. So overloading basically means that you are overriding or overloading an operator or what an operator does when it is applied to a class here. So for instance you might have been wondering about the different operations that the plus sign does when it is applied either to a string or to a number. So here is another example where I'm defining two strings. One is vanilla and one is cream. If I use here the plus operator applied to strings it will concatenate the two strings into one string. However, if I use here the plus operator um, with numbers it will add both numbers up. So that code block here will produce once the vanilla ice cream string and once 80. So we have here the same operator that performs two different actions. And the reason why that is possible is method or operator of function overloading in Python. These types of methods are also uh, referred to as the dunder from double underscore methods. You cannot only overload a plus sign, you can also overload many other binary operators or operators um, with magic methods. Here's a list of what you, methods you can define to overload or to rewrite what they would do. So if we have here the um, underscore underscore add method, we will assign what the plus 
sign does. Similarly, we can add a sub multiplication, div uh, floor division, true division, power function, and so on to define what um, a, uh, what these operators applied to a class would do. More precisely said, if we didn't assign any of these magic methods to a, in a class, or so if we didn't define them, they will not work. So if we would consider now our fish class and another object, uh, sorry, another parent and child class of that fish parent class, and we tried to add multiple fish into maybe a swarm, so by using a plus operator, this will not work as long as we did not define here the dunder or magic method for add. Similarly here an example for adding the multiplier. Before we get to that code block, still here just the hint that you can also add unary and comparator methods. So what will happen if you're using here smaller equals or smaller sign greater equals or not equal sign and so on. Or if you try to call the object as an integer, long, integer or float. Let's get, go back here to our example where we're defining now these dunder methods. So again here, the mackerel, a fish that uh, likes to swim in swarms, um, is here instanti instantiated with the private attribute of its family, which is here scompri uh, scompridae. Um, the species comes again upon initialization. And we start here with a self.count attribute, which means here I have one mackerel. Or just imagine it's just one mackerel. Now in the add method, I will define, I'm defining here that the value that you provide to the add method, meaning that comes after the plus sign, is added to the count attribute. For the multiplier, method, I would use here the multiply equals of the counter count method. So I would use here that argument that the multiplication sign receives as a multiplier. If we want to apply that now, we can instantiate here an object of the uh, mackerel, which I call here just the Atlantic mackerel, and the species Gombrus gombrus. And now here two examples of the usage now of the plus sign and the uh, multiplication sign. If I would try to use here the division sign, that will not work because I didn't design a division method here. If you want to try to implement that and if you want to make this mackerel uh, class a little bit more functional or maybe also add uh, comparative, uh, comparative uh, methods, um, and to it, I invite you now to just try design some new Dunder methods here, add it here to that mackerel class and play a little bit, have fun with creating mackerel swarms or dividing mackerel swarms. Now at the end of this tutorial on classes, I want to provide you with a custom Python class template that you may want to use for writing your own classes. This here is the example that involves the most important ones that you probably always want to define. One is here the init uh, function that or method that you have already seen for a couple of times now. And then here is just a method that you will probably want to define in some way. And then I also added here the call method. Why did I add that here? Well, it doesn't do any functional here, but to make your code a little bit more robust, it makes sense to have the call method in here. Um, so that will make, for instance, that um, if, if you would write something like Atlantic uh, mackerel, um, and parentheses, so a call to a class object 
which would basically be more like be a call to a function, um, needs to be de defined. So that is why we need to hear that call function. If I run that here, it will crash because I didn't define a call method. Hmm? So the object is not callable. So the call method will avoid that. If you're planning to work with uh, uh, graphical user interfaces, then classes will be very useful and um, also provide another example for the uh, familiarization with object orientation in the uh, sediment transport 1D exercise. Thanks for watching this video and have fun with classes and object orientation.